Good evening. So we're building a New York skyscraper here of 10 floors. We've already established the first floor, which is principle and foundation. We know the purpose of our life. We're here to praise God. We're here to reverence God. We are here to serve God, and by means of that, to save our souls. Amen? Amen. That's the foundation, and the second floor is that we had to encounter what are the major obstacles in our spiritual life. And that is the reality of sin. So you meditate upon the triple sin, begging for the grace to see sin through the divine perspective, through the eyes of God. So you meditate upon the sin of the angels, and the sin of Adam and Eve, and the sin of someone who is lost because of a mortal sin. Last week, we meditated upon the last things, which should be the first things we meditate upon. In theology, this is called eschatology, which means the study of the last things. What does that mean? We meditate upon the reality of death, what follows on the heels of death would be the reality of judgment. Then we meditate upon the reality of hell. And then heaven, purgatory. And then we meditate upon eternity, which means forever and ever and ever and ever. So that's where we're at. It's always a good idea to summarize what we've already assimilated in our meditations so that we can go deeper and deeper. So before introducing you to this week, which is very appropriate for the season of Lent, I'd like to tell you a Lenten story. A Lenten story. One occasion there was a priest that had a huge parish, and he was all alone to give out the ashes. So I thought, what am I going to do? Thousands of people, but I'm all alone. So he decided he would ask the sacristan if he could help him to give ashes. The sacristan was a good man, but a little bit slow and with very little memory. So the priest called him and said, look, Get in front of the people, take the ashes, and say, you are dust, and you'll return to dust. So the sacristan said, Father, I'm afraid, but I'll try to do it. So he got in front of the line, and he said, you are dust, and he forgot what he had to say. He went back to the priest and said, Father, I'm sorry, I forgot. What am I supposed to say? You are dust, and you shall return to dust. So he got in front of the people. There was already 200 people online. And he was intimidated. <laughs> and he looked, and he scratched his head. I forgot what I'm supposed to say. So he goes to the priest and says, Father, what's that phrase? You're dust, and you shall return to dust. So he goes, and now there's, a, there's 500 people waiting for him. And he looks and he says, 
Dusty, dust? He just couldn't remember. To go back to the priest against his father, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember. What am I supposed to say? So the priest was so frustrated, he said to the sacristan, you are a dummy, you're always going to be a dummy. <laughs> so I went in front of the line, and he said, you are a dummy, and you'll always be a dummy. You're a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. You're a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. And he said that another 5,000 times. So I thought I'd tell you my Lenten joke. Okay. So, where are we going to be heading this week? We're going to be doing meditation on a fascinating topic. And it is, we're going to meditate upon the capital sin. We're going to meditate upon the capital sins. And you're going to be begging for the grace of self-knowledge. You're begging for the grace of self-knowledge. As Socrates says, a, worth, a life that is not examined is a life not worth living, as Socrates says, right? Who is it, Toynbee, the famous historian that says that he who does not know history is condemned to repeat the same errors, right? All of you are ex expert in the Desert Fathers, right? There's a two-word axiom or maxim. Know thyself. Know thyself. So this is, so you see what we're doing, going from to the universal to the particular. We're meditating upon the sin of the angels, Adam and Eve. Now, my friends, we're going into our own inner world. That's right this own microcosm, this own inner world in which we want to see within ourselves. What are these tendencies we have within us? Do you know the difference between Protestant anthropology and Catholic? Well, I'll tell you. Martin Luther sees man as basically evil. Whereas the Catholic position is we're basically good, but we have tendencies toward evil or proclivities, inclinations toward evil. So that's a big difference. We believe that the human person is basically good, but we have these tendencies that pull us in the wrong direction. I know if you were in California, you ever have that, like a tug of war? No? Tug of war? When you got four boys there, four boys here, and you're tugging, in the middle there's a mud puddle with an alligator, right? <clears throat> so we have this tug of war within us. So we're going to be begging for the grace of self knowledge to know ourselves. All right, I'm going to start now with another anecdote. And if you can remember this anecdote, you're, you will remember this lecture uh, 10 years from today. Are you listening? Yeah. Okay, here's the anecdote. It's kind of like the super glue that holds together the whole lecture I'm going to be giving to you. The man was taking a walk through the woods with his son. As they're taking a walk, the father stops and looks at his son and says, you know, 
I have this wolf, this wolf that's within me, a voracious, malicious, angry, bitter wolf within me. So they're walking and the son is thinking, my father's got a, a wolf within, within him. And the son is trying to make tales of, what does this mean? My father has a wolf within him. So after 10 minutes, the father stops and looks at the son and says, son, I have a lamb within me. A gentle, loving, kind, peaceful, friendly lamb. So they're walking another 15 minutes. And the son cannot stand the suspense. He takes the father by the sleeve and says, Dad, which of the two is going to win? The wolf or the lamb? The father rivets his eyes in the eyes of the son and says, Son, whichever one I feed most. That man is you. That man is me. Who's going to win within us? The lamb or the wolf? Whichever one you feed most. So today, in the capital sins, we're going to be talking about the lamb and the wolf that is lurking in the inner recesses of our hearts. Are you ready? Classically, there are seven capital sins. Any of you who like classical literature, the greatest writer on the capital sins is a saint you've probably never heard before, but now you'll hear him, Saint John Cassian, C-A-S-S-I-A-N, okay? He's a desert father. St. John Cashman, but who really developed it in a synthetic, easier way to understand is St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay? <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas wrote like Ernest Hemingway, very succinct and concise and to the point, easy to follow. So Cashman, in Thomas Aquinas, if you really want to go deeper into this topic, I find this topic, topic fascinating. Even though I've been given this topic for many years, I always find it to be fascinating because this is us. We have the wolf and the lamb within us. Okay, classically, there are seven capital sins. Sometimes you get a, they'll add two others. They will add uh, vanity and melancholy is two of the additional ones, but here are the seven classical capital sins. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to give you the capital sin and the opposite. In a certain sense, what I'm going to try to give to you, I'm going to, I'm going to try to give to you Dante. You've heard of Dante and the Divine Comedy? Okay, you've heard of Dante. So Dante wrote the Divine Comedy. It was actually Boccaccio that actually gave the name, but we call it the Divine Comedy. And you have hell, purgatory, and heaven. So Dante's walking through hell with Virgil, and he goes from hell into purgatory. Once he gets to heaven, he's there with St. Bernard, okay? Not the dog, but the saint, okay? But there in purgatory, what does he do? So if you've ever read the Divine Comedy, Dante enters in with the seven Ps. You remember? Read it? Any of you read it? Okay. The seven Ps are the seven capital sins, <laughs> which have to be purified by the fire of God's love. 
So what Dante does is, Dante is the greatest writer in the Italian language, okay? Shakespeare in English, but Dante would be the greatest writer in the Italian language. Is he presents a literary contrast between the capital sin and the opposite virtue. I find this to be fascinating. And then Dante presents the way the Blessed Virgin Mary practiced the opposite virtue. So it's very Mary in the Divine Comedy. So if you're taking notes, I'll go through the capital sins, the, then the opposite virtue, and this would merit a seven-hour talk, okay? But I'll, I'll, I'll give it in six hours, okay? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll keep to the hour. The capital sins. Now, Father Broom has divided in them, the seven capital sins into two blocks. One refers to our corporal nature, others to our intellectual nature. Okay? One to our corporal, our body, the other to our intellect. So here they are, if you're taking notes. Gluttony. Gluttony, if you speak Spanish, la gula. Okay? La gula. <laughs> okay, then you have the following. It's called lust. In Spanish, la lujuria. <laughs> then you have the capital sin of avarice. Avaricia. Avarice is also greed. Okay? Then you have the capital sin of sloth. Sloth, we call it in common English, laziness. If you know the Spanish, la floqueta, if you speak Argentinian, Espanol, it's la vagancia. <laughs> <laughs> then you have the capital sin of envy. And then you have the capital sin of anger. Then what is at the root of all sin would be, of course, the sin of pride. Okay? Pride is at the root of all sin. In all the sins we commit, pride is present in all the sins. In which we want to do our own thing, we don't want to rely upon God. That's the essence of pride is self-sufficiency. We want to do it our own way. Okay, so let me give you the, the opposing virtues. So, my, the thrust of this talk is this. I'm giving the capital sin. And you're going to, okay, you're going to have to try to locate what is your capital sin. You hear me? And what, you, what you're going to discover is you have your capital sin, then there's going to be a not minor one. You're going to have probably one and two. Number, you got the biggie, then you get the minor. Like you go to college, you get your, minor, your major and your minor, okay? <laughs> So you're going to be aware of there's going to be the big one. Then there's going to be one following in its heels. Ten years from now, your capital sin might change. Okay? It's, it, flu it fluctuates. It's not always the same. But if you can locate this, this is huge in the spiritual life. Without this knowledge, you're really not going to advance to the level that God wants you to advance. So self-knowledge is very, very important to grow in your spiritual life. Amen? Amen. So here are the, here's the opposing virtues. <clears throat> the opposite virtue of gluttony is temperance. You hear me? 
probably don't use that word too much, but that technically is the opposite virtue. It's one of the four moral or cardinal virtues according to Thomas Aquinas, okay? Temperance. Okay, the opposite of lust would be purity or chastity. Choose, choose whichever one you want, okay? How about, the, how about the beatitude? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Matthew 5, 8, okay? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Okay, what about the opposite virtue of avarice or greed? Thomas Aquinas uses a technical word that only English scholars would use. It's called prodigality, but we don't use that in modern English. We would call it generosity. So the opposite of avarice would be prodigality if you want to be a Thomistic scholar but it's generosity. Generosity. How about the opposite virtue of sloth? Know what it is? It's diligence. Diligence. The work ethic. The work ethic. The work ethic that's not always present in the modern world, but our parents had the work ethic, right? Uh, my parents did, my grandparents even more so. Our parents and our grandparents, I mean, they had the work ethic uh, in our modern society to a limited degree. Huh? Okay, then how about the opposite of envy? I've always used one, then I was listening to Robert Barron and he gave another interpretation. I would put two, gratitude, Robert Barron puts admiration, kind of like that, admiration. Instead of envying the person, you're admiring the gift that comes from God. How about How about anger? Unless you've done the exercise with me, I'm sure you'd never know what it's called meekness. Meekness. If you speak Spanish, la mansedumbre. Manso y no menso, as they say in Spanish, right? <laughs> meekness. Meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. Got that? You hear me? Yeah. Meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. And pride, you know what the opposite of pride would be that of humility. So there you have the capital sin, and then you have the opposing virtue. Years ago, I was giving a retreat in Argentina, and a young woman said, Padre, yo tengo todos. <laughs> Father, I've got all of these. You know, in a certain sense, we all do. We all do, but to a limited degree. Some of the authors will actually add a couple more, vanity and melancholy, but we won't be talking about that. But vanity, let me just speak a, a minute on that. Okay, most of you are Catholics, right? Okay, at least you're trying to be, right? Okay, wait, we're in Lent, right? Is it a sin to put makeup on? What do you think? <laughs> is it a sin to put makeup on? What? No. no, it's not. You arrive at a certain age, if you don't put it on, it will be a sin, okay? <laughs> 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 
Some irate leaders are going to crucify me after this talk, right? You can already see. <laughs> All right, so there, the, there you have the capital sins. The capital sins. And the opposing virtues. So you're going to be begging for self knowledge. You'll, if you like, do you remember Superman? You ever watch Superman? You're, you're too young for that, right? Yeah. Was Superman strong or weak? Always? When was he not strong? When he's exposed to kryptonite, right? So you're going to be begging for the grace to discover your kryptonite, okay? Remember the Greek literature with Achilles? Was he strong or weak? Strong. Except what? Weak. Was Samson strong or weak? Strong. Except when he became a cholo, right? <laughs> Cut his hair off. Okay? So you're going to be begging for Self-knowledge. I'm going to tell you a, a personal anecdote, then I'm going to pull one of these sins and explain it in detail because of lack of time. Okay, when I was in, I was in eighth grade, I was brought up and raised in New York and New Jersey, okay? New York and New Jersey. When I was in eighth grade, my passion was baseball. So I played a lot of baseball when I was younger. And I played baseball first year at Villanova. I played the first year at the university. So i a pretty good athlete. So in eighth grade, I was playing pony ball. And I was a pitcher. I was a pitcher. And I did something that the coaches said, never do that. Because when you're in eighth grade, you're 13 or 14, don't throw the curveball. I'll show you why. This is the way you throw a curveball. Did you see me? I made a very violent action that, that, can, that can rip the arm of a 13-year-old. And I said, ah, who cares, no? <laughs> so I practice that with my older brother probably about a thousand times. So the opening game of the season, I pitched. Guess what? No hitter. Yeah. Do you know what a no hitter is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason is, is because I knew that these third, they'd never seen a curve and I was whiffing them right and left. It was KKK, not the Ku Klux Klan, but rather it was, because <laughs> they had never seen the curve and they were doing this. Whoa, <laughs> right over the plate. That was self knowledge I knew these kids, they'd never seen a curve ball, and I was gonna give it to him. <laughs> so the devil is an excellent pitcher. You got it? Got the analogy? He's going to throw a fastball, or a curveball, or a slider, or a knuckleball. He'll throw it on the outside corner, or the inside corner. He knows how to pitch. And he wants to strike you out so that you go to hell. That's his purpose. Got it? So I try to use very simple analogies so you can understand the topics. And if you know a modicum of baseball, you understand the analogy. Okay? All right. Of the seven capital sins, I want to explain one of them because of lack of time. I'd like to go through the capital sin of lust. Okay? This is the sin of the century, and I'd like to give you... You know, I'm, I'm going to give you a... a a, a flash mini-course on human sexuality. Okay? 
in the limited time that I have, but I can go through it very succinctly. Because this is where the devil has the, the best inroads on our human sexuality. So the opposite virtue is that of purity or chastity. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do now, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be basically giving you a summary of the catechism of the Catholic Church. You've heard of that? So this is the most authoritative source we have in the Catholic Church. John Paul II, right? The authority of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And what I'm doing, I'm going to go through the different sins against this virtue, and then what is the purpose of it and how we can practice the opposite virtue. Okay, let's start then <clears throat> with our thoughts. Our thoughts. Because chastity is not simply physical, it's also mental, it's emotional, okay? It's, it's much more wide than simply a physical act. It's much more extensive than that, much more. All right, question, bad thoughts, is it a sin? Is it a sin to have bad thoughts? Okay, I respond to it by another simple story. A priest was talking with a man, and he asked him, Sir, did you entertain bad thoughts? And the man said, No, they entertain me. <laughs> Okay, if you understand that pun, okay, you understand the whole idea. If you purposely, you purposely entertain bad thoughts on purpose, that's a sin, it is. We're probably all responsible for that in our lives, probably to a limited degree. So as soon as you're aware of a bad thought, what do you do? Reject it. When people come to me and they say, Father, I've got bad thoughts, right away I give them this advice. Say the Hail Mary and move on. Okay? It works. You hear me? You got a bad thought? Say the Hail Mary, expel it, and move on. Uh, that's the best advice I can give to you. Okay? Because the Blessed Mother is powerful. You believe it? Mary is very powerful, especially in conquering sins against chastity. Mary is very powerful, very powerful. Okay, so we, we start with our mind. How about our eyes? How often do we commit sins against chastity with our eyes? This would merit, my friends, a two-hour talk because the biggest addiction in our country is addiction to pornography, right? <clears throat> Last week, I think I talked to you about one of the reasons why so many young people are leaving the church. Did I talk about that? Is because so many young people, they look at pornography and they're addicted to pornography and they don't want to give it up. And they're not going to tell you about it because it's embarrassing, right? Daver Gwen says the same Spanish. It's very, very embarrassing. So all of us, we live, we live in a social milieu, which is called the electronic media. I was brought up and raised with books. I was an English major. I, I read a lot of books. This is back betraying my age in the early 70s. <laughs> yes, but today we live in a world of images. Instagram, right? YouTube, Facebook, okay? And 
It's a two-edged sword. I have my, I have my face, I have Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. I got Twitter. I've got it all. I've been on the radio. I've been on TV. I write books. <laughs> I try to use all the modern means to preach the word of God, but those means can be used for other purposes, right? We have to make sure that when we're looking at something on TV, the movie, our phone, the iPad, we have to make sure that we're looking at only good things. You hear me? And it's not easy. It's not easy, but we have to beg for the grace not to become a slave of our passions, of our eyes, of our imagination, and of the internet. You have billions of dollars that are, are being pumped in to pornography. Billions of dollars. Because my friends, we, we live in a pornographic society. You hear me? Whether, whether we like it or not, what I'm telling you is the truth. I don't like this topic, but as a preacher, as a confessor, and as your friend, I've got to cry out, wolf. I got to cry out wolf because this is pushing so many of our young people away from the church and pushing a lot of people into hell. Okay, you meditated on hell last week, right? We don't want to end up in hell. We don't want our children and grandchildren to end up there. But that's where the devil has his stronghold in that area. So enough on that specific dimension of our conversation. Okay, let's move on. Modern psychology will disagree with me, but the Catechism of the Catholic Church says clearly that masturbation, it's a sin. Okay, you hear me? Psychology would say, no, just follow your feelings. Don't thwart your, 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 your sentiments, your feelings. It's wrong. It's an act of selfishness. And read the Catechism of the Catholic Church if you don't believe me, okay? There's one very clear number on that. Let's move on. Next is the word fornication. Have you heard the word fornication, any of you? Okay, another name for fornication is premarital sex. Premarital sex. Someone might say, well, Father, everyone, everyone else is doing it today. I don't care. It's wrong. Against the Sixth Commandment. I mentioned the commandments today, right in the Mass, right? It's against the Sixth Commandment. Sexuality has its purpose where? In the context of holy matrimony, between a man and a woman, the marital embrace has to be open to life also. Otherwise, any time we're abusing our sexuality, objectively, it's a mortal sin, okay? Objectively, it's a mortal sin. So fornication is premarital sex. Now what's happening today, some of you that are of my vintage, my age, when we were little kids, I don't remember any of my Catholic friends in New York and New Jersey whose parents were not married in the church. I don't remember any. I had friends that were Italian and Irish. They're, all of them were married in the church. Now, Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is shacking out. Huh? Excuse my English. <laughs> Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is shacking out. They're starting to live together. They're living in free union. And what do they say, the young people? We have to see if we're compatible. <laughs> We got to see if we got chemistry, 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 like chemica, right? Yeah. That's what they say. 
So they have what's called a trial marriage. We're going to see if it really is going to work out. And they're living together for 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they're still waiting to get married in the church. And you know some of them, probably some of your sons and daughters, they're starting to live together. They're saying that's the way it should be. That's called permanent fornication. Got that? That's my own terminology. Okay? Permanent fornication. They're living in fornication permanently. And every time they have sex, mortal sin. Mortal sin. Mortal sin. Remember the rules for discernment? That's exactly what the devil wants. Mortal sin. Mortal sin. Mortal sin. Mortal sin. sin. Then no longer their conscience bothers them. They die. Their soul is lost for all eternity. Yes. Okay, let's move on. Fornication, adultery, <clears throat> adultery. I once heard uh, a priest said he was confessing a little kid, and the little kid said, I, he was eight or nine years old. He said, I, I lied, I stole candy, I punched my brother. I stuck my tongue out at my grandmother. (laughs) Then the little kid said, also, Father, adultery. (laughs) Wow. Getting younger and younger. Nine years old. And the priest said, you, adultery, what did you do? He said, I disobeyed the adults. (laughs) Unfortunately, that's not what adultery is, right? Adultery is you're cheating on your spouse. We have a lot of people that are married here. Okay, tighten your spiritual seat belt now. Okay, we're going to, we're going to Ma- Magic Mountain now, okay? <laughs> okay, physical adultery, you understand that's a no-brainer. We all know that. Sin of David, right? But you can commit adultery in other ways. Listen to what Jesus says. Are you listening? Jesus said, it was said, you should not commit adultery. But this is Jesus. But I tell you, whoever looks at a woman with bad intention, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. (laughs) I'll see in the confessional after the talk, right? (laughs) Wow. You hear that? It's not Father Broome, that's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ. If you're a married man, married woman, you're looking at pornography, you're committing adultery against your spouse. Hello, anyone home? Yes. 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 You, look at it, you look at pornography, you're married, you're looking at another woman, right? Or another man, you're committing adultery. You are. You see? The virtue of purity, that's what I'm talking, is very, very difficult. Very difficult. But you want to go to heaven, right? Jesus says, blessed are the pure of heart, they will see God. And Our Lady of Fatima said, most souls go to hell because of this sin. Our Lady of Fatima, a hundred years ago.
Okay, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Okay, have a fight with, you have a fight with your spouse. And you start to daydream your ex-boyfriend, Luisito. Not Romeo, Romeo, where, where there art thou, but rather Luisito, Luisito, where are you? So you're daydreaming on your ex-boyfriend. Is that right? Hello? Hey, that's an adulterous thought. That's an adulterous thought, because you're married. You're married with Juanito, right? You're married with Juanito, and now you're thinking of Luisito, right? <laughs> or how about, uh, how about this? Cyber pornography. You send, I think that young people call it, is it called sexting, like texting? You heard that before? It's called sexting? I think it's that the, that's the way it's called, okay? Texting, sex. You send a bad picture of yourself. That's wrong. That's really common today. <laughs> you know, that is the most... Say, for example, you send a bad picture of yourself, it can go viral overnight. Tell your kids this. If you don't, you do it. Stop doing it. <laughs> Or you send a text message. You're married and you send, okay, oh, un besito. Okay. You know, we can, we can send messages that are adulterous. Yes. It's very demanding. Okay, let's move on. How about telephone calls? You can have adulterous telephone calls. That can happen too. Well, how about this? How many of you work here? At least you fake it. You, you work? All of you work? How about at work, you end up by fl flirting with another person? Huh? During the coffee break, the coffee break, you got a young man. Oh, he's we he's really guapo. He really good, right? <laughs> and you like to talk with him. Ah, but we're just we're just friends. We're just friends. Friends. <laughs> we're just friends, no? And Saint Thomas Aquinas speaks about the importance of the virtue of affability. I have to be affable, I have to be friendly, huh? And every time you have your lunch break, you look forward to sitting down and having a cup of coffee with that very attractive man. No, we're just friends, though. And one day he doesn't show up and you feel sad the whole day. There, 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 there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. Because you're married. You can't be establishing an emotional bond with this person. So to make a long story short, adultery is much more extensive than simply a sexual act with a person that's not your spouse. That's the obvious, the sin of David, right? But it goes much more beyond that. So to be able to live this virtue of purity, hey, my friends, is very difficult. And you can't do it, none of us can do it without the grace of God. Amen. It's a supernatural virtue. We have to implore God's grace to help us. Let's move on. 
I know that this is very controversial, but it has to be said. The practice of homosexuality is wrong. You hear me? The practice of homosexuality is wrong because God created male and female, right? Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? Okay. God said a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and what God has put together, let no one rent asunder. You hear me? We as priests, we talk a lot about these pastoral topics, and Father Larry, I think, has given the best argument. Whoever says that the practice of homosexuality or lesbianism is good, you're calling Jesus a liar. That's strong. For me, that's the best argument. You hear me? Yes. That's the best argument. Because Jesus takes that text from Genesis chapter 2 and he repeats it. So if you're saying that the union between the same sex is good, you're saying that Jesus was lying. And that's terrible, isn't it? You go before Jesus on the day of judgment and said, to Jesus, you're a liar, where are you going to go? You, you call Jesus a liar? <laughs> and this is, after abortion, this is the biggest danger in our country is the LGBT, transgenderism, transhumanism, and we can go on and on and on. After abortion, this is the biggest danger in our country. Because why? Abortion kills babies. Same-sex unions is destroying families. You hear me? It's destroying families. And do we have any students of world history? Okay, if you study world history, the Greek civilization, the Roman civilization, all the great civilizations, they fell apart when? when the family was rent asunder. And we are in danger in this country of losing our society. If we're promoting something that is against the word of God, it's against natural law, as well as it's against common sense. So you heard it. So all of you have to be staunch defenders of traditional marriages between man and woman united in love for the purpose of mutual love and procreation. Amen? amen. And amen? Amen. Amen. amen? amen. So there you have it. This is very controversial, but all of you have to study this topic and defend traditional marriages because our country is in danger if our families are rent asunder. Our, our, our society is in danger, in great danger. And you know it. And I know it maybe more than you, but I know we're in real danger. We cannot defend our families. Okay, another element that has to be said. This topic is so important that our life and our salvation and the salvation of our children depends on understanding this message. Okay, 1968, July, where were you? You weren't born yet, okay. 1968, July was one of the key watershed moments in the history of the world. What happened July 1968? Pope Paul VI, you've heard of Pope Paul VI, right? He issued the most explosive 
controversial and cyclical in the history of the church. And that was Humana Vitae. So all of you should read that document. I think it's going to be given out, Mary? No, we'll give it out next week. We'll okay, next week, we'll, next week we'll, be, we'll give out that document. It's an encyclical of Pope Paul VI. It's called Humana Vitae. And have all of you, have, have all of you heard of Humana Vitae? It looks like I'm speaking in, in, in hieroglyphics. Have, how many have heard of Humana Vitae? Okay, that looks like 75%. The others have not? Well, Humana Vitae is this. John the 23rd, before Paul the 6th, called together a commission to study the, the possible use of what's called the pill. The pill. The contraceptive pill. And in the commission, there were priests and scientists and experts, intellectuals, and it seemed as if almost all those involved in this commission, they favored the use of the pill. Yeah, almost all. Guess what happened? John the 23rd, he died. So it was in limbo. Paul the Sixth, Pope Paul the Sixth, reconvened the, the group of people commissioned to study this. And almost all those who were in the commission accepted the use of the pill. Except three persons. And these three persons had a lot of weight. One was, he was a, an archbishop from Krakow, his name was Karol Wojtyla. Never heard of him? Okay, his name is Karol Wojtyla, and he wrote Love and Responsibility, the Acting Person. And then there was another person who didn't agree with it, and that was Paul VI. There was a third person that didn't agree with it, and that was the Holy Spirit. Okay. So you had Paul VI, the future John, John Paul II, and the Holy Spirit that did not agree with it. And what was published? Humana Vitae. And I'll give you a literary, succinct summary of Humana Vitae. Paul VI says this, every conjugal act, every marital act between husband and wife has to be open to the possibility of life. Therefore, any use, any use of artificial means of contraception is intrinsically disordered. When this was published, my friends, the spiritual, moral, atomic bomb exploded. And from that moment on, my friends, the church has become divided over that issue. You who were brought up and raised before 68, the church was basically united. Priests agreed, bishops agreed. Now everyone, as the poet says, John Donne, everyone is an island unto himself. That's true. Yes. Everyone is an island unto himself. You go to one priest, he says this. You go to another priest, he says the exact opposite. <laughs> but it all started with that. And sad to say, many priests, many bishops decided to jettison that, to throw that out the window. Do any of you know the Winnipeg document from Canada? The Winnipeg document was all the Canadian bishops wrote a letter of defiance rejecting the teaching of Paul VI Humana Vitae. Look at Canada now. Look at Canada now. Look at Canada now. So these were bishops that 
that wrote a letter of defiance of an encyclical written by Pope Paul VI. So what has happened since is many Catholics, I would say probably most Catholics, are moral relativists. You hear me? What does it mean, moral relativism? Moral relativism means this. The church teaches this, but I believe this. Some of you have heard of Scott Hahn. Yes. Scott Hahn calls it cafeteria Catholicism. You ever go to a cafeteria? You pick and you choose whatever you want to eat, right? So there are many, most Catholics are cafeteria Catholics. They're moral relativists. They pick and choose according to their own moral taste buds. <laughs> but my friends, we don't believe in safe sex. We believe in sacred sex. Amen? We don't believe in safe sex. We believe in sacred sex. We don't believe in birth control. We believe in self-control. Amen? <laughs> And this condemnation is heading toward condemnation, too. <laughs> How true. So that's another topic. There's a good chance that probably many of you have given into the contraceptive mentality. Listen to me. Be converted. Amen? Be converted. Do not capitulate to the contraceptive mentality which is so widespread today. We don't believe in birth control. We believe in self-control. We don't believe in safe sex. We believe in sacred sex. So all of us must strive to live a life of purity if we want to go to heaven. And I'd like to offer to you three ways in which we can live the virtue of purity. Number one is this, we gotta pray. We gotta pray, 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 pray. And beg the Lord for the grace of purity. St. Augustine says, we are all beggars before the Lord. We're beggars. <laughs> beg for it. This is Ignatius. Ask and you'll receive. Knock, and you'll be open. Seek, and you'll find. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door will be open. Beg the Lord to give you a pure heart. And my friends, if you live purity, God is going to work through you. But if we're giving into impurity, my friends, our spiritual life is paralyzed. Okay? You hear me? Yes. If you're living a life of purity, God can use you to save millions of souls. But if you're a slave of impurity, we're a slave of the devil, and God cannot use you. So let's beg for this grace. So pray. Pray and beg. And pray for your poor children. So many of your poor children are slaves of their sexual passions, sad to say. And we know that. We know that. Second is, if possible, go to communion every day. Every day. Because when you receive Holy Communion, you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Amen? When you receive Holy Communion, you have a spiritual heart transplant. Amen? You have a spiritual mind transplant. <laughs> no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Huh? When you receive Holy Communion, the precious blood of Jesus is rushing through your veins 
and pumping through your heart because you've got Jesus within you. Amen? Amen. And last but not least, if you want to live a life of great purity, love the Blessed Virgin Mary. Love the Blessed Virgin Mary. Pray to Mary. Do you know what's better than praying a rosary? It would be to pray two rosaries. <laughs> you know, I, I was driving up here with Eric and Mary. You know what we did on the way from Hawaiian Gardens to Alhambra? We prayed one rosary, a second rosary, a third rosary, midday prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, the prayer of the Angelus, and the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, and then we drove right into the parking lot, right? So pray and pray and pray. Prayer, the Eucharist, a Marian devotion, and you will be able to live out that beautiful beatitude. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, Mary. Blessed are thou, Mary. Holy Mary. Pray for us. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So you can go to your groups and do your sharing.